Hey YouTube, this is Itchy, and I wanted to give you a breakdown of the various types of nuclear attacks because I've had a few inquiries as to how Fukushima relates to a nuclear bomb. And with what our current situation is with Iran, this has been a bit more in the forefront of everyone's minds. So I broke it down into three main threats, starting with the most severe, a nuclear attack on a large a U.S. city, to a multiple nuclear plant meltdown after a large earthquake or sun flare on our own soil, and to the ongoing radiation exposure that we're getting from Fukushima. So I'll keep it simple, and I'm going to close a bunch of links for you guys to look into this further. So how do you know your nuke attacks? Number one, a nuclear bomb in a large U.S. city uh, would be the most severe thing that could happen and probably the most unlikely. But anyone who is close to the detonation would instantly be vaporized. There would be a large crater that would form at the site of the detonation, and the amount of damage done and the amount of radiation released from that type of event is going to vary largely on the uh, size of the bomb that was used. Now, our international security experts have determined that the threat would most likely be a 10 kiloton bomb that would be brought into a city center by truck. And bombs can range anywhere from one ton to 100 megatons, like the Tsar Bomba that was detonated in Russia. Now, if you work in a city center or you're near a large city that uh, could possibly be a target for terrorist event, um, you're gonna wanna watch this nuclear attack video. This is on Spike TV. It's an episode of Surviving Disaster where a Navy SEAL takes you through all of the steps from uh, detonation to uh, securing yourself and others in your group, um, provided that you survive the detonation, to a secure area until you can be rescued, which will take several days' time in the event of such a disaster because of the large amount of destruction and casualties that would occur. And there are many good points in this video, although it is extremely graphic and a bit upsetting to watch, um, it is the reality that we are faced today with so many uh, nuclear bombs in the hands of our enemies. So I'm going to put a link to this. It's about 40 minutes long. And it's important to understand that even if you survive the initial blast, there's going to be a fallout cloud that's generated from this event. You have about 20 minutes if you're within the city itself to either get into shelter or get out of the city. And he discusses the various scenarios that could impede you along the way. And uh, it goes far beyond the scope of what I can do in a 15 minute YouTube video. The second scenario, although let me just also share this map with you quickly. Um, I'll enclose a link to this map. This is actually uh, fairly interesting. You can drag and drop a target of where a detonation may occur. You can choose the size of device that could potentially be used and once you detonate it, it will show you um, in terms of range where the fireball would affect uh, the radiation or radius from the event, the air blast from the event which would compromise any structures um, what would happen in this gray area would be fatalities would be widespread, third degree burns would extend all the way out to this radius here, and this would be for the largest 100 megaton explosion, and you can um, clear this out and try different uh, size bombs. This is the 10 kiloton bomb that was uh, determined to probably be the most likely uh, detonation used. So I'll put a link to this. And the second item would be multiple nuclear meltdowns on U.S. soil. Um, of course, even one is bad. The first indication if you're near a nuke plant that something is uh, going on is that there is smoke or steam coming either from the reactors themselves or the buildings around the reactors. You may also see a large number of first responders or firefighters en route to the scene. You may hear a siren that uh, I ran at the beginning of this video. 
If there's an explosion of the reactor, then you would need to evacuate immediately. And if you're, especially if you're close enough to hear it or see it, um, if you aren't sure, you could always shelter indoors. And that's something that you will have to consider individually as a family. And with how many people in your family may be at high risk, such as if anyone is pregnant or has young children, um, it, it may be more advisable to move as they would be more affected by a radiation release. Now, in order for a, a multiple meltdown scenario to occur, we would probably uh, have to be hit by either a large earthquake or a large sun flare that would take out the transformers to some of these new plants. And now this is just in my area. Fermi 2 plant actually had a meltdown in 66. There's a book on this called We Almost Lost Detroit, and this would have been the area affected all the way out to almost Pontiac, Michigan. Um, that would be highly contaminated in terms of food, water, soil, and air. Now, the third attack, and it's one that is actually currently ongoing and has been for almost a year, is the radiation that we are receiving from Fukushima. And this is a simulation that was done um, for the first couple weeks of the release. And don't let this mislead you. This is still going on. This plume that you're seeing hitting the West Coast and traveling onward throughout the rest of the United States and Europe is continuously being measured in precipitation and rain and snow. Um, it's being measured in soil samples. Even plutonium has been measured. And this is an ongoing threat. An analogy that has been used by a researcher in October was that it's like a Hiroshima bomb is going off every day over this plant and blowing over here. And that was back in October when the releases were actually less than they are now. Um, there's two parts to this. The, the releases that are coming directly out of the ground, uh, which is from the, um, the overheated corium and all of the water that's being dumped on the reactors to cool them and is going into the ocean. The second part of this is a burning of radioactive trash all over Japan. And that's what Arnie Gunderson refers to as Fukushima Part 2. Then there's the radio radioactive debris field or possible radioactive debris field, uh, 50 billion tons worth, that is on its way to the West Coast and right now is located approximately here. And evidence of this has been washing up. I am not aware that any of it has been found to be radioactive yet. And then we have a rad slick that is occurring off the coast of Japan and is slowly spreading its way over the ocean that contains boric acid, which is basically killing anything underneath it. And this is also an area um, of the ocean where all of our storms get generated out of. And then you have the ashes that are left over from the burning debris, which is right now enough to fill 50 football fields, nowhere to put it. That contributes to the overall contamination of the island of Japan. Um, so they're burning debris, they're releasing into the air, they're releasing into the ocean. This is happening every second and every minute of every day, and it has been for almost a year. Um, a report came out back in April of what are they going to do with all the radiation contaminated bodies, because if you cremate those, that just goes up into the air again, too, to get breathed in by somebody else. Um, this Fukushima is really in a class by itself, and, and TEPCO says it's going to take 30 to 40 years before the plants will be decommissioned, at least 10 years before they can even reach the fuel. Physicists are saying that it's going to take centuries. We have no scientific knowledge right now of dealing with this problem. And what we need to happen is that every smart person on the planet that works independently from the nuclear industry needs to get on board to determine if at this point anything can even be done to contain this situation, and that includes, you know, we need physicists and we need scientists and doctors and engineers working on this problem. And then we need farmers and we need grocery stores and we need school systems figuring out how we're going to deal with this current threat to keep contaminated food and water off of our store shelves. And it could be something, you know, as, sim as simple as feeding bentonite clay to the the cows, which should be, it should have been going on basically since last year, since April. 
um, for all of our dairy cattle that are in um, the west part of the country and uh, in areas of, of Wisconsin and so forth, these cows are grazing on radioactive fallout that's landing on the grass and it builds up from biomagnification in the food chain. It doesn't get lower, it's gonna get higher and it's already detected in the milk and in the beef and in other food sources. Um, there, there's a potential for a whole new industry here as well. You know, mitigation and measuring people's houses and um, you know, going to schools, educating people, educating physicians that don't even get any information in med school about the effects of radiation on health. They don't know anything about this because there isn't anything coming from the CDC or from the AMA except that the levels are okay. It's the biggest problem that we've ever faced and it has no boundaries. Um, hopefully the number one and number two scenario will never happen, but if it does, you need to have a plan. And if we look at the scenario that could occur with a sun flare taking out our electrical grid, I mean, where are you going to go if you live in this area? Um, west of the Mississippi or north into Canada is really your only choices. I know in my area, if I had um, a number of nuke plants melting down, this look at how many I'm downwind of. I live right here. I certainly wouldn't stick around. And I've had a, a plan since last summer with my ex-husband's family about what we're going to do for, for everyone to get them to a safe location. People need to talk about this and, and be prepared for it as it ha if it happens, which hopefully it never will. But in the meantime, we have this ongoing threat from Fukushima that's happening every day, every second, and every minute of every day with no end in sight. Please share this information with anyone who you think can help because we need to get this figured out and we have lost a lot of time already. Um, I'm going to include a link to my Facebook page where I post news all day long. Um, FukushimaFacts.com is another website. If you're not on Facebook where the news feed goes into and there's mitigation tips, educational videos, and I also started a Twitter account and the only thing that is going to get posted on this account is if there's some type of nuke emergency or the, um, the forecast that I do three times a week. Because right now, the best thing that you can do is avoid it in your everyday life as much as possible since it's uh, a problem that is never going away, not in our lifetimes and probably not in our children's lifetimes. Everyone stay safe and I'll close some links for you.